Hello and welcome back for the second half of the macromolecule chapter. Uh, we're going to cover proteins and nucleic acids. Uh, these guys have their own kind of section here. Uh, I've kind of held them off because these are two of the most critical things for humans, any animal, plant, bacteria, anything alive for them to function and survive. Uh, proteins especially are, are incredibly important because they act in so many capacities. Um, most anything with color is because of a protein. Many of your hormones are because of proteins. Uh, a lot of your structural components, uh, the, what makes your bones flexible, what holds all your organs in place, the stuff that makes up your fingernails, your hair, these are all proteins. Uh, what does chemical reactions, we'll talk about enzymes later, all enzymes are proteins. Uh, so there's going to be an incredible amount of the molecules in your body. In some cases, it can be upwards of about half of your dry body weight. I should say body mass here to be correct. Uh, is going to ultimately come down to proteins. So these guys are huge. Which proteins you have can largely determine how well you function, if you function, if you survive. And a lot of that's because they can be incredibly diverse owing to the fact that they're a polymer that consists of amino acid monomers. And there are 20 different amino acid monomers. Each of them has a different R group, so there's basically several parts of an amino acid. Uh, they typically have a carboxylic group, a carboxylic acid group, hence the acid. Uh, they tend to have an amine group, an NH2 group, that's an amine or an amino group. Uh, and then they have oftentimes like a hydrogen off one side, but then they have this R group. So they've got this one other piece that comes off, and this piece ultimately is different for each amino acid. And this R group can have different characteristics. That R group might be polar in one type of amino acid. Uh, it could be nonpolar in another. Uh, it could be acidic. It could be basic. It can have these different characteristics that can help give uh, uh, that a little bit of that characteristic to the protein as a whole that's being made. And so if a protein being made has a lot of polar amino acids in R groups, uh, it's likely that that protein is going to be much more polar overall. And so it can be used in certain areas where you need them to be polar. So these R groups are critical, and the fact that there's 20 different amino acids to choose from is critical in giving us a diversity. There's a tremendous, insane, it seems like, number of proteins that can be made. Uh, just a simple thing, if you have a seven-digit phone number, you've got ten options for each number, zero to nine. Uh, that gives you a million different possible phone numbers, if I, I've done my math there correctly. Uh, ten to the seventh. Uh, ten is the options that you have overall for each slot and seven slots. So if you figure that many proteins can be thousands of amino acids long, you know, so that's like a phone uh, number that goes on for like 2,000 digits. And for each one slot, where normally in our phone number we can put a 0 through 9, you'd have 20 different options. So there's this nearly, I don't want to say infinite quite, but there's this ridiculously high amount of proteins uh, that could be made, even if you cap off proteins at only, say, 5,000 amino acids. Uh, obviously, if you go on forever a number of amino acids, you could have an infinite amount. Uh, but realistically, biologically, there's just an insane number which allows proteins to do so much because we have so many options uh, as we are building proteins and, and mutations occur and allow changes in the proteins, we can get new proteins that serve different functions, uh, in some cases better functions, that allow us to develop new characteristics or better versions of the old characteristic, as well as worse ones, although those people typically die off and take their little screw up with them uh, that didn't turn out so hot. Now, in addition to having so many different options as far as the order of amino acids and which amino acids you choose. There's also going to be levels of structure we're going to talk about. Now the first levels is pretty straightforward. It's primary structure, primary for one, and that's where we actually just bind these different amino acids together. Uh, sometimes they'll call that a peptide bond, just a covalent bond, and so you'll just bind them together more or less in a linear fashion. Obviously they can bend and weave a bit, but we're sticking them together bit by bit, kind of like you're putting beads in a necklace uh, to get this long chain. That's our primary structure. And so most of our proteins are going to have a unique amino acid sequence. So they have a specific order of amino acids and a specific total length overall. Now if we mess with that, if we do some substitutions, I won't really get later on, we'll talk about 
uh, in much later chapters, deletions and things like that. Uh, but if you just do small changes even, you can get different structures. You can get where they're affected. And so for instance, if we mess with hemoglobin by swapping out just a little bit as far as amino acids go, uh, you can ultimately end up with your blood cells changing overall in their shape. Hemoglobin is one of the proteins they have, and it makes them sickle-shaped. And so it's not surprising we call people who have that, uh, we call them sufferers of sickle cell anemia. And that's because these blood cells don't really do their job as well. They tend to die off, they tend to clot. Uh, and so individuals tend to get anemia, low blood cells, uh, low red blood cells, and they tend to get clots, which can lead to organ failure, pain, and a bunch of things that are not positive. Uh, so people that have two of these alleles get sickle cell anemia, and that's a very n bad thing to have. Uh, it does help prevent you getting malaria, but if you get two of these alleles, uh, the change in the protein structure can be a very negative thing. And so this just illustrates that even small changes in exactly which amino acids you have can have an effect in what you get and, and what that protein is capable of doing. Oftentimes negative, sometimes it just doesn't matter. It's a similar enough amino acid that even though you change the amino acids, it's still polar enough that you get something similar, uh, and occasionally you might get something better. Secondary structure is where we take this longer chain and we start to kind of fold it up and hydrogen bond it to itself, uh, which will allow it to ultimately get into these different structures, uh, these different higher level structures. And the common ones we'll see are these folded sheet looking things called pleated sheets or beta pleated sheets. And we'll see where it twists, where you get this kind of uh, helical shape, and we call that an alpha helix. So those are the two secondary structures that we'll talk about. And just remember it's, it's due to hydrogen bonds and we're going to get these helixes and the, these folded sheets, these pleated sheets. And then those secondary structures, whoops, those, how did I lose one here? Oh, wow, I'm out of order. Uh, these secondary structures can ultimately go through and develop into tertiary structures. And what the tertiary structure is, is this is going to be a, a third level structure where these alpha helixes and these beta pleated sheets and these, these earlier levels of structure can start to interact with each other. So there are groups start to get near one another, close enough sometimes, that if they're both nonpolar, they kind of huddle together, just like the lipids would do to form a bilayer, uh, and that's because they're both hydrophobic. So you can get what we call hydrophobic interactions. You can get where if they both have a sulfur that's kind of near each other, those sulfurs can bind and form a disulfide bridge. That's an actual covalent bond. You can get hydrogen bonds, and in some cases, if you've got a carboxyl group, they'll kick off the H, so they'll essentially lose an H plus to become COO minus, and you'll have NH3 will oftentimes grab hold of an extra H plus, so essentially it gains one to become NH3 plus. And so these guys can actually get together, for instance, and get this ionic bond if they get close enough because opposites attract. And overall, what this gives us then is all this comes together to give this this complex 3D conformation or shape. And this 3D shape of a protein, or in this case, it's oftentimes considered a polypeptide at this point, because um, it's not quite as, as big as most of our proteins are, uh, that's going to be considered critical because the shape of a protein determines its function. If we change its shape or its conformation, we, we change the ability for it to function. In most cases, if something stops functioning, and that's a vital function, you're screwed. In some cases, it's not so important, and so if that one changes its function, it's not as big of a deal, so you can get new traits. Uh, so this could be something where like, the pigments in our eyes can mutate and become blue instead of brown or green. And ultimately, that really didn't impact as much, so you see that mutation can continue because nothing weeds it out. And so these things will occur, but this 3D shape is critical to, to enzymes, to all proteins, and exactly how they function. And there is one, and I'll, I'm going to jump back here to get there, uh, there is one more level that you can have. Uh, some proteins pretty much end at tertiary. They get one giant polypeptide, which ends up being a protein. But a lot of proteins are actually composed of multiple polypeptides. And so we call that the quaternary structure, where they take this chain of amino acids, they hydrogen bond it into these shapes. Uh, they ultimately bind those together, these 3D shapes, but then many of them will actually take multiple of these polypeptide subunits, and then they'll stick them together to make this kind of one big protein. So for instance, hemoglobin, which is what you see here, it's comprised of four different subunits that all stick together, 
And so because it has four of these polypeptides, these four subunits, uh, it has a quaternary structure to make the protein. Uh, collagen's not much different. They just kind of weave together in that one because it's a longer overall protein. But both of them have quaternary structure because they have multiple polypeptides in one protein. And that's, that's very common you'll find. Okay, nucleic acids. Uh, this one, there's two big guys that you should know, uh, DNA and RNA. And that shouldn't be too much of a surprise, seeing as they both have nucleic acid in their name. That's the Na. So it's deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. Uh, we'll talk in a slide coming up as to why they differ in that first word, or first prefix, if you will. Now, these will both be critical. Just like I said, proteins are, are essential for most things to live that are uh, living-wise, or at least anything remotely complex, even like a bacteria as we know it now to live. Uh, DNA and RNA are, are probably just as important because DNA contains the storage, the information that gets copied to RNA, right? That way the DNA is protected. The RNA is then used, and you can see tRNA, mRNA, and the ribosome itself is rRNA. They are then used to make proteins. So the proteins that you can make, the, the, the way that we do this is encoded in your DNA and uses RNA to allow it to be produced. So if protein is critically important, these both have to be critically important as well because they determine the proteins. And polynucleotide, uh, because nucleotides are the monomer, will oftentimes, or in some cases, you might at least see it referred to as a polynucleotide instead of just saying nucleic acid, just terminology. Okay, the nucleotide is the monomer. This is the piece of any piece of nucleic acid. Uh, these are the smallest pieces. Uh, and they're going to be composed of three different things. A phosphate group, which you guys have probably seen in chemistry, PO4, 3 minus. A pentose sugar, which is oftentimes drawn kind of like this, where each of the corners symbolizes a carbon. We won't worry about the other mole molecules and atoms that are part of it. Uh, so that'll be the pentose sugar. And then it has a nitrogenous base, which will be a base that's either a pyrimidine, long name, which means short structure in my memory. Uh, I always remember it's the opposite. So big name, it's the smaller one. They're composed of one ring. And then there'll be purines, small name, which are the bigger structure. There are two rings. And there's, in DNA, four overall nitrogen bases, cytosine, thymine, adenine, guanine. And what'll happen is when you talk about, whoops, when you talk about RNA, instead of thymine, it will have uracil. That's really the only difference. Uh, they still have cytosine, adenine, and guanine, but when it comes to nitrogen bases, that's the only difference. All right? Now, speaking of DNA and RNA, there is one other difference besides the thymine and uracil, and that's that they also have a different pentose sugar. They both have a pentose sugar, they just have a different one. Specifically, DNA has one that's missing in oxygen, all right, deoxy so without oxygen, uh, otherwise it's identical. But because it's different, because it's missing that oxygen, they get their different names. Now the significance of this is I can't take like an adenine nucleotide that also has a phosphate and a sugar, I can't take that if it's RNA, and I can't exchange that with one that's DNA, I can't assume that they're the same. Because even though the adenine and the phosphate are the same, this sugar will be different. One will be ribose, one will be deoxyribose. So DNA and RNA nucleotides, even if they contain the same nitrogen base, are not interchangeable. Uh, the other word you might see is nucleoside instead of nucleotide. And this is just when we kind of ignore the phosphate aspect. Uh, you'll see there are other molecules that are derived from nucleotides that we will talk about. Uh, ATP, for instance, an energy molecule, and ADP, uh, both are essentially derived from a, a nucleotide. And so we will talk about some of these other guys. And so a nucleoside is kind of like the base unit of that, where it's just a nitrogen base and a sugar. So you can't get a whole lot simpler and resemble much of a, a nucleotide at all. So that's a nucleoside. Over here, too, you can see RNA has one strand, DNA has two, and those two strands will be hydrogen bonded together here in the center. Uh, we'll talk about that coming up here in just a second. Oh, and you can also see this is going to be the uh, long names, the pyrimidines. This will be a purine, and you can just see they've got like these two rings versus one ring. So when I was talking about that, that's what they're talking about. Okay, and then the last bit here is just that these guys, these, these perhaps handsome British devils, I don't know if that's a actual, 
oxymoronic phrase there. Uh, but they're Watson and Crick, all right? And these guys in the 50s came up with the structure of DNA. That's the double helix. Uh, we just showed it on the last slide. We talked about the hydrogen bonds that are between those nitrogen bases. Uh, so as those bases kind of stick out from the ladder, if you will, I'm, I'm not drawing this twisted because I can't draw that well. So these would be the nitrogen bases that would be in the center, and there'd be hydrogen bonds that are holding them together. Sometimes they're shown as like dotted lines uh, all along the center of the thing here, the middle of the ladder. And they do so in a way that's called complementary paired, or complementary pairing occurs. And what that means is adenine, the nucleotides that contain adenine, only want to bind with the nucleotides that contain thymine. So if this guy has an adenine, this one would be thymine. And the ones that have guanine only want to pair up with the ones that have cytosine. And so this helps, and help them I guess, but helps us too figure out how DNA replication occurs, which is when we copy DNA, which is critical for the function of reproduction, because you need two copies to give one to your offspring. And so by having this system in place, by discovering this, it made it pretty easy that I could kind of get rid of this strand and I could rebuild a new one because A would want to get with a new T partner. Even if you took away the original, C would still want to only get with guanine, uh, you know, T would only want to get with A, etc. And so you could rebuild a new strand that was just like the old one, uh, accurately, efficiently, without many errors. Ideally without any, but let's face it, there are mutations, it does happen. And so that's the idea here, and that's ultimately why they were able to win uh, the Nobel Prize uh, when they discovered this and for their discovery. So at this point, we've wrapped up proteins and we've wrapped up nucleic acids. That's it for macromolecules for now. Uh, we're going to talk about enzymes coming up before we get into cells. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, have a good night.